Well, hello and welcome to another episode here at Nightscape Images. And you know, the most common question that I get asked about my Nightscapes is how I light subject matter. And today I want to pose you a question. Is light painting for Nightscape Images more about science or is it more about art? Now, this is a bit of a trick question, but I want to go through all of the intricate details of the various aspects of light painting and how I apply those aspects. And hopefully at the end of that, we can come out with an answer, perhaps, to that very important question. Okay, now you may well have heard people talk a lot about good light. They're out shooting somewhere in a forest or on a beach or whatever, and they see this glorious sunset and they say, look at that fantastic light. Now, what is it that they're actually talking about? So I want to bring a few things to our attention today. Most people regard good light as light that has some sort of shape and character. And beyond that, probably uh, we're talking about angle of light. So when people uh, go out to shoot, most of the time people who shoot landscape photography are shooting at sunrise and sunset. Why? because there's two things. One, the sun is low down in the sky and therefore the sun angle is able to uh, hit things, you know, not directly front on like it is in the midday sun. And secondly, the other thing is the color of light changes. So when you're looking at a sunrise or a sunset, you've got this typically this golden hour or this, this light that is more of a, a warmer tone and a warmer color. So as photographers, our challenge is to use whatever light there is available to our greatest advantage. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? So first thing I want to show you about our nightscape photography, talking about this subject of light and light painting and etc., is to make use of what available light there is to our greatest advantage. How do we do that? Well, I'm going to show you now. All right, now first up, I'd like to draw your attention to this image here. Now, this is one of my favorite shots that I've taken. That's why I've got it printed here. Now, this is actually a four shot panorama. And I did a video explaining a little bit about this image some time ago. You can see the link here. But what I want to show you is the glow on the horizon behind this tree. There is no light painting at all in this shot. You can see the tree here is silhouetted against this glow. Now, the thing I want to draw your attention to is when I scouted this location out, during the daylight I went there and thought, yeah, beautiful tree on the horizon, uh, plenty of sky above. I had no idea, really, that that glow on the horizon would be there. And then I didn't have any idea exactly how that silhouette would look. Now, I knew that I was going to be shooting the panorama. I wanted to get the Milky Way core across there, as you can see. And I've got that. But it wasn't until I took the shot and I was there that I realized because of the conditions that were there, there's this really faint uh, cloud on the horizon that caused the lighting from a town, which was probably 20 or 30 kilometers away, to actually light up underneath that cloud and give it that golden glow. Now, I'm just explaining here that I've made use of the available light that was there. There was no moonlight, no light painting, just a little bit of glow on the horizon. So this is one example where a low level of light pollution, as in this case, can actually be used to our advantage. Now, lots of people will recommend taking nightscape images when there's a moon in the sky. And there's no doubt that's a pretty valid way of shooting nightscapes. As you can see in these images, which were totally lit by moonlight, it's possible to obtain wonderful results with this method. I actually find that the best time to shoot is when the moon is less than about 30% intensity and preferably out of the frame of the camera's direct view. Although, if you want something more moody, then by all means include the moon in the shot. This will have the added benefit of backlighting the subject. If you look at these two examples, you'll see what a difference even a crescent moon can make to our subject. The image on the left was shot at 2.39 a.m. with about a 30% setting moon behind the camera. The settings were 14 millimeters at f2.8, 20 second exposure at ISO 2500. Whereas the image on the right hand side was taken at 3.49 a.m., so about an hour later, on the same night after the moon had completely set, 
with exactly the same camera settings. The thing you'll notice most about these images is how much the sky is washed out by the moon being in the sky. Another thing you'll notice when shooting in moonlight is how the colour tone of the sky changes to a more blue colour. Now this usually requires an adjustment in our white balance settings. So I'd like to show you another one of my favourite images. Now this is Eddie Stone Lighthouse from Tasmania from my trip to Tassie earlier this year and you can see the link to that video just here. Now that particular night there was moonlight in the sky and so I decided I would uh, shoot at this lighthouse and take a number of different images. Now up until this image was taken, the moon was a crescent, probably about 35%, maybe 40% in the sky. And so I took a number of images with just moonlight and of course the light from the lighthouse. Now, by the time I got to shooting this particular image, the moon had set. So the lighting conditions changed completely. And what I did, I made use of only the light that was coming from the lighthouse. Now you can see if you look closely, this all of these rocks here and this water here is reflecting light directly from the lighthouse. Now over here there's a little bit more light. Now what I did for this particular shot, um, I did I think six images for the sky and I stacked them uh, to get noise reduction. And I also did, I think from memory, three images of the foreground at a longer exposure. Now I think they were at one minute, um, no, 30 seconds. I think I didn't have an intervalometer with me, so it had to be 30 seconds. So that was the best I could manage with the equipment I had. Uh, but I stacked them to get noise reduction. And because in the low light situation there's all, and a high ISO, there's always going to be a lot of noise. But this image printed, as you can see here, looks absolutely fantastic. And once again, it's lit simply by the lighthouse. No light painting, no torches, no nothing. And I wrapped with this shot. Love it. And so my question remains, is lighting for our nightscape images based around science or art? Well, let's continue. So I'm sure the majority of you are more interested in how to light up our foreground subject matter using various artificial light sources. I've showed you plenty of times before what types of lights I use to do my light painting, but I'll show you again my preferred units. Here is a selection of lights I've been using for a number of years and I find they each have a specific place and purpose in my kit bag. So by far my most used light is this one. It's a simple torch or for my American friends a flashlight and this particular one is the LED Lenser P7.2 but I do use other ones. There's this one as well. Now the thing that I love about these particular torches is the fact that you can actually zoom the light simply by pushing and pulling in this case and the other one uh, from a wide beam to a narrow beam and that gets me into some places I can throw the light further by zooming the light and I can do it all one-handed. And of course the other thing that people ask me about all the time is this gel that I have placed on the front of my torch. Now, let me explain. The reason I have the gel, which is known as a CTO gel, color temperature orange, is to change the color of the light source. Now, you may be familiar with LED lights. They tend to be a very blue color out of the box. And if you look at these images here, you'll see just the typical light with someone shining torches up into the sky. The beams look blue, whereas everything else doesn't. That's just simply because of the colour of the LEDs. Now what I do, because I don't want to muck around too much with my images with colour tone changing in software, I tend to put a gel on my torch and what that does is brings that colour back to a closer to a, a daylight white balance. Now when I'm shooting subjects matter and lighting subjects out in the field, I don't want things to look blue. I want them to look a better colour. Now sometimes and hear this uh, clearly, sometimes I lower my white balance in camera deliberately. And when I say lower the white balance, I'm talking about the Kelvin number. So typically daylight uh, white balance is somewhere in about 53 to 5500 Kelvin. And if I lower my white balance, let's just say to 4000 or 3800 Kelvin, that makes the image blue all over. 
Now, some people like to do that because they like the, the night sky to have a little bit more black or, or dark blue tinge to it rather than yellow and orange. That all comes down to our artistic taste. And you know, there's a lot of arguments out there about that, but I'm not too interested in arguments. I'm more interested in what we like the look of. But if that's the case, if I lower my white balance down, then I need to use this gel to warm up whatever light painting I do in the foreground. Because if I didn't, if I just used the torch with no gel, such as this one, you can imagine, because it's already blue by the nature of the LED, it's gonna be even more blue. So no, I don't wanna do that. And by the way, if you're wondering about what that gel is that I put on my torch, here it is. It comes in a roll. And this is known as a half CTO gel. In Australia, where I live, this is a part number of 205. And I just bought this at a, at a theatre supplies shop. Now, they don't necessarily know that it's photographic gel. It is proper photographic gel. Um, and it's tough. You can't break it. It's very strong. And it's not very expensive. And that's what I use to cover my torch. Now, I want to show you another light. And that is an LED light panel. And you can see this one here. This is what's known as the Z96 video light, but there are plenty of other types of lights. Now, you'll notice this comes with an orange gel that uh, with magnets clips on the front. Now, I use this all the time for what's known as low level lighting. Low level lighting is where you have uh, a constant light source on a particular subject in your foreground or perhaps in the background of your shot for the full duration of the image. Often I'll use both types of lights together. For example, in this shot, I'm lighting the tree with the LED panel for the whole duration of the exposures. And at the same time, I'm using the small torch to do the light painting on the truck in the foreground. On this occasion, I've placed the LED panel inside the cab of the truck for one of the exposures. Then I've turned it off whilst I took the other images. Then I've blended them all together to compose the final completed image. Now besides the Z96, which I just showed you a minute ago, there are all sorts of low level lights, LED panels, that can be used for this purpose. Now, this is a very popular one. This is a loom cube, very small light, very small indeed, and very bright and powerful. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't use these very much. I know a lot of people that do, and they swear by them. Um, and they're a very good light source, very small, pocketable. You can take them in your bag anywhere you wanna go. This is another one, um, much larger light source. I'm going to talk about the size of light sources later on. Uh, the thing that I love about this particular panel, you can see it's quite large, but the thing about it is it's color changeable. It's got different colored LEDs. So it goes from a, a cool white or a white balance of, let me say, about 5,500 Kelvin to a warm white of about 3,200 Kelvin. And it's all built into the, the lantern itself. All right, so to try and illustrate my point a little bit more, here is another one of my favorite images. I've got a lot of favorite images, but this one I just absolutely love. Uh, and I've used different types of lighting to create this image. Firstly, I shot one background sky image, as you can see there. That was at, uh, using my Nikon D750 20 millimeter f1.8 lens at f2.8. The shutter speed was 15 seconds and the ISO was 6400. One single shot. Now, when I took that shot, there was no lights on anywhere. It was just complete darkness and silhouetted building at the front here. Then what I did, I closed down the aperture to F5, uh, also lowered the ISO to 500. Now, you've seen me, I've done this on a lot of different shots. Um, left the shutter speed at 15 seconds. Now, by doing that and refocused, made sure the focus was sharp on the building. By doing all of that, gives me my best chance of getting a really sharp, in focus and really detailed image. Then, the next thing I did was I put my Z96 video light inside and you can see it here, the light, it looks like there's somebody home in the building and that was my point. Just took one exposure for that and I think that was, I think they were all the same shutter speed and everything else. I didn't, I didn't do any, anything radical for any of these, I just did that. Now, you, you realize that that light is dimmable so, and, and a lot of you are gonna ask me, well, how bright does that light need to be? And my answer is, it doesn't matter. You just take a shot. If it's too dull, you brighten it up. If it's too bright, dull it down. It's really quite simple because that light is dimmable. Then I took that one out totally and started light painting the building, the tree, this tree here, the grass, everything else, all from different angles and directions and ended up with about eight shots. 
Then I blended them all together in uh, Photoshop with the background and this is the final result. And as you can see, this is a print. It looks absolutely amazing. Absolutely lovely shot. Now, you know, I'm not too sure we're any further down the track of determining whether science or art plays the greater part in our light painting of our nightscapes. But one thing you can see from all of the things I've showed you so far, there's a fair bit of planning that has to go in before you even get out there to do any light painting. Now that is firmly in the science category, planning and working out angles and all the other things to do with that. So what I want to do now is show you another aspect that is really important for our lighting for nightscape images. Okay, so this is something I want to get into, which is a little bit unusual for nightscape photography and particularly landscape photography in general. But I want to talk a little bit about portrait lighting principles. So what I'm effectively doing is incorporating principles of portrait lighting into landscape and nightscape photography. Now, what does that mean? Well, essentially it goes a bit like this. Firstly, I never ever put any light source directly in the same line as the camera angle because that creates a deer in the headlights, a very harsh look without any form or shape or shadow. What I tend to do is get my lights off center to the sides and as much as possible to the back. Now, if you're doing portrait lighting, you tend to have uh, key lights, then you'll have uh, fill lights on the other side, and then you'll have something like a hair light or a kicker light coming from behind to give shape and definition down behind the subject. Now, typically that's a person. In my case, I'm shooting old trucks and cars and tractors and buildings and trees. So what am I doing? I'm doing exactly the same thing. I'm putting my lights off on angles and I'm able to move my light source. Now, typically when you're doing portrait lighting, you will have umbrellas, soft boxes, large light sources. Now you would have been taught in any Photography 101 settings for portrait lighting that the larger the light source, the softer the light is. And that is very true. Now let me demonstrate. I've got a torch here, which is a small light source. I'm going to put it onto this uh, Godox AD600 here. And I, what, what I want you to specifically look at here is the shadow. Now, by the way, I do this at my Nightscape workshops all the time, little illustrations like this, and hopefully it makes sense to you guys. Now, have a look at that shadow in the background. Because this is a small light source, the shadow itself is quite hard. It's not soft at all. But have a look at this. If I move the light from side to side as if I was light painting this subject, then what happens to the shadow? It actually moves. Now, because the shadow is moving in a long exposure, what does that mean? What it means is, is that the shadow is blurring. In other words, the shadow becomes soft. And the other thing is, by moving the torch alongside the subject, then I'm actually wrapping the light around. Now, particularly if I get off to the side, you'll see that what I'm doing is wrapping the light from here around. Now, the shadow is changing. Yes, we've illustrated that, but this is still a hard light source. No matter what I do and put that torch on that light there, it's still going to be a hard light source. Now, you could look at other light sources. For example, my Loon Cube. It's still a hard light source. Why? Because it's very small. I can still do the same thing and move the light around. You can see the shadow moving, but the light itself is still a hard light source. Okay, what other alternatives? Now, if I put my light panel on, this is a bigger light, probably nearly twice as big as the torch I had before. What you'll notice there is it's a little bit softer. The principle is that the larger the light source, the softer the light is. Now, you can see the shadow is softer. If I was to bounce this light source off something else, let me just do that quickly. Okay, I've got this white card. Just watch what happens if I bounce the light from the card. Have a look at that. See how soft that shadow now is compared to where it was before. And why is that? Simply because I'm bouncing off a larger light source. So these are portrait lighting principles that we use all the time in our photography, inside in studios. And what I'm doing is taking it outside into the landscape. Fantastic, isn't it? Now, the next thing I want to show you and illustrate to you is what happens with the different angles of light. So here we are. We've got the torch up 
facing the this uh, Godox AD600 here pretty much from the same direction as the camera. It looks pretty ugly because it's just front on harsh lighting. Now, if I start bringing the light around to the side and around to the back, you can see suddenly we've got shape and we've got direction in our lighting. It makes all the difference. And we even come around to the very back and look at that. Suddenly that light has some character and it's the character that we're looking for in our images. Look at that. We've got the light around on the other side now. Now it's flaring on that front there, but you see what I'm saying? The angle, even from above, look at that. When you've got a light coming straight down from above, look at the difference that makes. And even we can put the light up underneath. There's all sorts of things we can do to create some texture and some shape and character. That's the thing. We want character in our nightscapes. All right, now I don't know how many favorite images I'm allowed to have, but hey, it's my video, so I can have as many as I want, I reckon. This little boiler on wheels is definitely one of my favorites. Now, I scattered this out some time ago, and if you want to check the video, I did a complete video on the, on the lighting and the production of this image. Check it out here. Uh, and that goes into quite a lot of detail on the lighting techniques and the types of lights that I use to illustrate my point. So I'm just going to briefly explain here before you go to that video. What I was talking about before about lighting from all the different angles, you can see the various highlights around these spoked wheels. They seem to be that the light's coming from all different directions, and that's because it is. The light is coming from different directions. So the idea is to create highlights and shadows. It's as simple as that. We don't want flat lighting. We don't want everything to be lit the same, because if everything's lit the same, it's boring. It doesn't have texture and shape, and we want that shape, especially with something like this. It's a curved object, so the light falls off and wraps around. And so this is a classic illustration of what I'm talking about by using the light coming from angles and definitely not coming from the same angle as the camera. So when shooting out in the field, I'll combine all the techniques I've explained on the basis of portrait lighting principles and this means never lighting directly from the camera angle. Rather, getting off to the side and even using a backlight to get the subject in shadow and silhouette. I've been shooting this way for many years and it's no secret that this workflow has improved the quality of my images in the process. As you can see, the actual light painting in the field with a real subject out under the stars is a tangible art form. And whilst relying on the principles of light and shadow, bears little resemblance to what we may have thought would happen simply based on a scientific understanding of things. Now, just to wrap up this section on lighting, there are three things to consider when doing lighting with nightscapes with an external light source. One, how bright is the light? Two, how far is the light from the subject that we're lighting? And three, how long is the light shining on the subject. All three of those things are important and they all interact with each other. So if I have a uh, 10 second shutter speed and I have my light source only on for one second, then obviously there's not gonna be as much light there as if I had the light going for the full 10 seconds. Uh, and the same is if I have uh, a 10 second shutter speed and I'm lighting for 10 seconds, but I've got my light way back in the distance somewhere. I need a lot more light because the light falls off over distance. The closer I bring the light into the subject, the brighter the light is going to be. And of course, uh, the intensity of the light source is critical. So that's why I like the torches that are zoomable. When they're wide open, it's a nice, soft, even light. And when I zoom that torch in a little bit, the light becomes more intense in a smaller beam. It's like as if it's pulled into this small space and that makes it brighter. So therefore, if I want to throw the light at any distance, I will zoom the light because that throws more light. So I hope that all makes sense to you. And so you may have guessed already, even though we need to understand light and how it works, the most important thing for us to develop is our ability to use these various tools to create art. Photography is a creative art form, yes, based on science, physics, and mathematics, but at its very core, it's simply an expression of our heart and passion. 
for what we see in our mind's eye. And that's the most important thing. All right. Well, thanks again for joining me here tonight. We're inside, we're not out under the stars. That's where I prefer to be. But you know, I love this stuff and I could talk about this stuff literally all night. So until I see you next time, I'll be really pleased to read all your comments and chat with you down in the section down below. And uh, I'll look forward to seeing you probably out under the stars and another adventure really soon. Okay, see you later.